about uh, what you would like to accomplish in Washington in the House of Representatives. Uh, maybe uh, we've talked a little bit about things that involve uh, foreign affairs, in particular energy and environment, but I know you have some positions on some of the other things that people associate with foreign affairs, including our, uh, our strength in the world and our position in Iraq. Uh, uh, well, I think the Iraq issue is always is, is one on the top of everybody's list. It may not be now, the economy may be, but let's start with Iraq. I think that, you know, we've lost almost 4,000 troops there, and it's very sad that, uh, that they sacrifices that they've made. But I, I, I just think it would be wrong to leave Iraq other than with honor. So my, my motto is leave Iraq with honor, not haste. And I, I think what that means is that we have to leave so that Iraq is at least has a stable government that we're leaving it to and that Iran won't come in and, and overwhelm them or dominate them to a point. And I think the real point that really hasn't been stressed in the media is that if we leave too soon and we lose, and, and Iran becomes the controlling force in Iraq, that they could dominate the oil supply from the Middle East. And we get, well, about 20% of the world's supply comes out of there. And if they cut that supply off, the effect on the United States economy could be so dramatic. I mean, the price of oil, you know, is now $110. It could skyrocket even higher. And I think that you're looking at gasoline prices that would jump immediately to 5 to $6 a gallon. I mean, that's my personal estimate. That's not, I don't have any scientific. But when you reduce the supply by 20%, I think the price is going to jump, you know, close to that. So you're looking at 5 and $6 gas, a dollar or $2 increase in gasoline immediately. So I just think it's to our personal interest and our economic interest to make sure that when we leave Iraq, that we do it in an honorable basis and that we're comf comfortable and confident that Iran is not going to come in and dominate the company, the country, and and somehow there's a strait right, of a harmoose where the 18 million barrels come out of every day that they could cut off that would just be a, a tragedy for our economy. That's the strait between Iran and the Saudi Arabia yes, Peninsula. Yes, yes, yes. So, I mean, it's, it's very sensitive to our, and, and right now we have a lot of military force there to make sure things like that don't happen. But if we cut and run, which some of my opponents are advocating, I just think it would be a disaster. Now, you, you have uh, actually, uh, you know, the rest of the world, you have some experience. You were an Air Force pilot for three years and so forth. Uh, what about uh, the rest of our uh, military, combined military uh, diplomatic uh, approach to the world? Well, you know, I, I, I am an advocate of Ronald Reagan's peace through strengths. And I think that we have a strong military that we're, it's a deterrent. You don't have to use it. But, I mean, Ronald Reagan built it up and it, we, we won the Cold War without ever fighting. But it was because of our tremendous strength that we developed in our military. And I just think that some of our programs are not being kept up to demonstrate that strength. And I, I'm particularly aware of the, the C-17, which is a transport plane the current day version of what I flew when I was in the military. I was a, a pilot in the Air Force, uh, and I flew these large Globemaster, uh, Globemaster transports that we could handle 250 peep troops with full pack and with equipment. So, I mean, I, I'm familiar with what those airplanes do, and you have to have those airplanes to move troops in a matter of days any place in the world. I mean, whether, whether it's Afghanistan or whether it's Iraq, or whether it's in Korea or any place, you've got to have that mobility. And I think right now the contracts for those C-17s are very short. And every year they come up and they renew them. But, I mean, it's, it's how they maintain a, a supply chain with, with only a one-year uh, forward purchase, it's, it's a challenge. And I would work hard on that program, and I'm sure there's a couple others that are in the similar situation. So I think that I would make sure that I worked with whatever agency or whoever to get those programs so they're viable on a long-term basis. Well, let's come, come back to the United States. Uh, a moment ago I asked about transportation because you do have some real contributions there, but maybe you'd like to go on to that or some more thoughts about our economy and keeping people uh, with opportunities for jobs and so forth. Well, I think uh, staying with the economy for a minute, I think you know, I'm a CPA by background and a businessman, and I think what I bring to Congress would be the practical aspects of 
balancing the budget without increasing taxes. I mean, everybody says, well, you can't do that. I mean, you've got to raise taxes if you're going to balance the budget. And I think that the big costs are Social Security and Medicare. I mean, those are the third rail for most politicians. But when I go to Congress, I'm going to be holding to no one. I mean, I am, I am my own man. I mean, at, at my point in life, I've had my business career and I've had my public service. So when I get there, I, my goal is going to be to, to balance the budget without increasing taxes. And I think we've got to look at Social Security. I think we can do it without jeopardizing the, the benefits to the current seniors. Now, I'm not talking about the future seniors may be different, but the current seniors would not be jeopardized. But I just think we've got to do something because that's 40 to 50 percent of our budget are those two programs. And they continue to grow. Do you think that, that those are the kind of programs that have got to be slowed down and we've got to develop a system? I mean, uh, current President Bush looked at that and he said, you know, uh, we've got to develop a system for those that are n not near retirement but have an alternative system for them so, so that we're able to save the system over time. Well, he came out with a proposal that only was going to cover 5% of Social Security. I mean, that was all the funding was on the, his program. And, you know, it didn't have the support of Congress. And I just think that whatever it is, whether it's that or something else, it's got to have the support of Congress. I mean, we got, those guys have to touch the third rail. I mean, it's a political dynamite. Because, you know, the, if, you, if you start talking Social Security, the whole state of Florida and the whole state of California just says, hey, what are you doing to me? And I, my, my answer would be, we're not going to do anything to you, but we've got to do something. When that program was started in the 30s under FDR, there were 55 workers for every one in retirees. Now there are almost only two workers for every retiree. So, I mean, you, you expect these young guys to support every half their salary is going to go to support you and me as we get over our age to take Social Security, which I've done. So, I mean, it's not going to work. I mean, it is a, the, the unfunded cost now for both Medicare and, and uh, Social Security is so great that you can't even. Tens have, of trillions of it's dollars. Tri tens of trillions. That's right. Uh, one program, I think, is two trillion. The other is 15 trillion. I mean, the so, numbers are so big. No one appreciates it. But I, it's, that's, I mean, I'm a CPA and a businessman. I will give it everything I got. If it's not, you know, I may not have any magic, but I've worked a lot of impossible things over my life. And I would try and do it again. That's, that would be my thought on the, on the budget.